Hi everyone, welcome back. I hope you've all had a good week. So today's case, I don't even know where to begin. It is a messy one. So I actually first came across this case when I was watching some trial footage on YouTube because I actually really loved watching trials when I get time. And I just stumbled across some clips from this case and I ended up watching the trial and I was so engrossed. First of all, I didn't have a clue what was going on most of the time. It was so messy. I'm innocent, I didn't do it. Okay. I've, I've maintained that the whole time. And I just couldn't figure out what the actual story was. It was a lot of like he said, she said kind of trial. So I was just so intrigued by it that I had to do some more research, some more digging to actually figure out what the hell happened. And that is what we're doing today. I'm going to be sharing with you the case of Christopher McNabb and Courtney Bell. Chris and Courtney were in a relationship with each other and it was very messy, very toxic. They were always fighting with one another. There was a lot of abuse in the relationship. They were always doing drugs. They definitely prioritized drugs over everything else. But everything that I've just said is not the most notable thing about their relationship. Oh no, because Chris and Courtney were first cousins. So we have a little bit of incest in today's case, which is honestly disgusting. However, this case is truly heartbreaking. Like it really is. It's so incredibly sad because Chris and Courtney, they did have children with one another. And today we're going to be talking about the murder of a two week old baby, which is just absolutely horrific. Those words should never leave anyone's mouth. Kalia McNabb was only 15 days old when she lost her life. And obviously this is not an easy easy case to hear. This is horrible. It's heartbreaking. And at the end of the video, I will give a warning before though. So don't worry. We are going to be talking about pretty graphic injuries to Kalia, which is just heartbreaking. I feel like I'm getting emotional already. So just be aware of that before we get on to today's video. It's not going to be for everyone. And I completely understand. Just skip this one if it's not for you. So with all of that being said, let's jump in. So I just want to give a huge thank you to the sponsor of today's video and that is ExpressVPN. So I feel like we all need to be a little bit more security aware when we're using the internet nowadays. I mean, there are just so many ways that people can access our data when we're using the internet. Whether it's your internet service provider selling your browsing data or even hackers stealing your personal information when you connect to sketchy Wi-Fi networks. You just never know who is watching you use the internet, what they're going to do with your data, who they're going to sell it to. You just never know the risks. Well, that is where ExpressVPN comes in. ExpressVPN creates a secure tunnel between you and your device and the internet. So when you are using ExpressVPN and you're using the internet, literally no one can see what you're doing. Meaning that things like private emails, passwords, financial details are all completely secure. But not only that, ExpressVPN has one very huge benefit because it allows you to change your location, which means that you can access content from all all over the world. So for example, if you have a Netflix subscription, you can change your location using ExpressVPN, meaning that you have access to thousands of more TV shows and movies that you wouldn't normally be able to access. And I've got to tell you that feature just comes in handy because you know when you just want to watch a particular film, like you have your mindset on something and you want to watch that film. Well, that was me with The Dark Knight, which I've got to say is probably the best Batman film ever. So I really wanted to watch The Dark Knight, but it wasn't available to me in my country. So I did a quick search on where is The Dark Knight available on Netflix. And The Dark Knight is currently on the German Netflix. So I changed my geolocation to Germany using ExpressVPN and voila, it was that simple. The Dark Knight was available for me to watch. ExpressVPN works on all devices. I have it on my iPhone, I have it on my iPad, my laptop, and it is super easy to install and use. And if you guys wanted to be more safe and more secure using the internet, or if you just want to access content from all over the world like Netflix, then you guys can get three months of ExpressVPN for free right now by going to the link in my description box, which is expressvpn.com forward slash Danielle. Thank you again to ExpressVPN for sponsoring today's video and making it possible. But thank you to every single one of you watching right now, because truly without all of you guys, I wouldn't get opportunities like this. And now let's jump into today's case. So we are doing a couple today, obviously. So we do need to go into the background of both of them, but we're going to 
start with possibly the, the, the worst of the two, even though they're both pretty bad, to be honest. So we're gonna start with Christopher McNabb. So Christopher McNabb was born on the 23rd of March, 1990, making him an Aries. And he goes by the name Chris. So I'm just gonna call him Chris for the whole video. He grew up in Cartersville, Georgia, where he lived with his dad and his stepmom, Michael McNabb and Crystal. So we don't have too much information on his background. It is thought that his biological mom did walk out on him when he was very young. And he was raised by his dad and his stepmom. Like I've said, his dad was a very hard worker. He made sure that Chris never went without. It was a pretty stable family and household. However, it was when Chris got into his teenage years that everything just seemed to go south. He literally just went completely off the rails. He just thought that the rules didn't apply to him. He did turn to criminal activity and oh my God, does he have a criminal record, which we'll get onto that in a minute, but he just made his dad's life a living nightmare. He was so disobedient. He did whatever he wanted. He was a menace, basically, a menace at home and school. And it was the age are 14 that Chris first came onto the radar of the police. This was following an altercation, which I don't know what that altercation was. And this was apparently resolved and no charges were filed. But then it was just a few months later when he was 15 that he got in trouble with the law again. He actually broke into a house and stole a few belongings from that house. He actually was caught for this and he was charged with criminal trespassing and stolen property. As far as I'm aware, he didn't actually receive any punishment for this but already at the age of 15 he is racking up his criminal record because we are not done yet. Another favorite thing that Chris liked to do other than getting into trouble with the police was running away from home. His dad would just come home and Chris would be gone. He would disappear for days on end. Now Chris's dad would report him missing to the police and most of the time when the police did find Chris they would find him hiding out in some kind of motel doing drugs. But this is definitely a habit that Chris takes on to his adult life. He likes to run away. But when he was at home, he was also an absolute nightmare. He would never listen to his dad or his stepmom. He never respected people's boundaries or the household rules. He would steal from his parents. He would steal money. He would steal jewelry to fund his drug habit. He actually stole $7,000 worth of jewelry from his stepmom at one time to fund his drug addiction. He was very argumentative. He was also aggressive. Police were called out on a number of occasions there was even one time where Chris basically attacked his dad and the police were called and Chris was charged with battery. He would also be destructive around the home as well. Like there was this one time where Chris's dad was asleep on the sofa and Chris tried to steal a pack of cigarettes from his dad's pocket when his dad was asleep. His dad woke up with his son trying to steal his cigarettes. His dad confronted him and Chris completely lost it and actually punched a hole in a wall. So he's just out of control. Like I don't know how else to describe him. He is out of control. He is volatile. He has a very short fuse. And a lot of the time when the police were called out to the home, Chris would try and turn the situation on his dad. He would try and say to the police that his dad was actually the problem, not him, which is completely untrue. Chris was the problem. Chris has accused his dad of also being physically violent. Chris actually said that he only punched a hole in the wall because his dad punched him 20 times and also beat him with a belt. And obviously you have to take these accusations seriously and the police wanted to believe Chris. And they said to Chris, like, can we see your injuries? Can we see like what your dad has done? They wanted to verify this story. So Chris took his top off and there was not one single mark. The skin wasn't even red. And he has been punched 20 times and also beaten with a belt. The skin would be red in places. There would be physical evidence of an attack like that. But there was just nothing because Chris lies. Spoiler, he lies all the time. Chris was just making this stuff up to save his own skin. And this is another very common theme throughout this whole video. Chris likes to manipulate people and try and turn a story around to make him the victim. Him. He hasn't ever done anything wrong. And now we need to get onto his extensive criminal record because I know I've already said a few things, but we haven't even scratched the surface. So now Chris is 17. And what does Chris decide to do? He decides to turn to a life of crime. And honestly, there is just so much. I feel like I'm just going to have to list it off. And I'm really sorry if it does just seem like a list. So on the 7th of June, 2007, Chris decided to carry out his 
first big robbery. Chris spots a local business that has this brand new white Ford truck in a compound. It's like behind this chain link fence. And Chris decides to jump over the fence, steal the car, and then drive the car through the chain fence. Chris does get caught pretty quickly and he's charged with criminal trespassing, damage to property, and theft of an automobile. And then just 11 days later, he's at it again. I know, only 11 days. It's like he can't help himself. So he breaks into another business, steals another Ford truck. Again, the truck is in like some kind of compound or whatever, and he drives the truck through the chain link fence again. He's literally just committing the same offense, but this time he actually nearly takes out a security guard. When he drives through that fence, there is clearly some security there. The security try and stop him, and he nearly runs over this security guard. Once again, Chris is arrested for this. He is given the same set of charges, which is criminal trespassing, uh, damage to property, and theft of an automobile. And it's like at this point, he's committed two offenses that are the exact same offense, basically, in the space of 11 days. Maybe he should, I don't know, go to prison for this? Like, I don't know, do something, receive some sort of punishment? But no, Chris is released. Every single time he is released. But guess what? He is back at it again. Nine days later, he literally does the exact same thing. He breaks into a business, steals a car, rams it through the fence. He is again arrested and charged with very similar offenses. He is then released. It's like, oh my God, seriously, released again. Three days later, he breaks into a friend's home. <laughs> He's not really a very good friend, is he? So he breaks into his friend's home and steals a PlayStation 2 before driving off in his friend's car. Again, he is arrested, charged, and then released again. <sighs> Just, it's really infuriating, isn't it? And the very next day, the very next day after he was released from the theft of his friend's property, he is at it again. He breaks into another business and steals a car. He is again arrested for this. And I just feel like this is so ridiculous. I don't think I've ever, ever come across someone committing so many offenses in such a short space of time. And each time he is caught, each time he's arrested and charged. And it is just ridiculous at this point that every single time he's released in less than a month, he has committed five separate theft offenses. And I honestly don't have any answers for you as to why he hasn't gone to prison. Like why hasn't he gone to court and been charged with this and then gone to prison? I don't know. But thankfully after the fifth time, things seem to catch up to him. So at the age of 17, Chris is sent to prison and he would remain in prison until the age of 21. So that is Chris's background, which I think it's safe to say that that was chaotic. So now we need to get on to Courtney's background. So Courtney Bell was born on the 23rd of March 1993, making her an Aries, which does mean that we have an Aries couple. She was born to parents Tim Bell and Pamela Hamby. However, her mom, Pam, walked out on her when she was very young. She didn't want anything to do with her, leaving Courtney to be raised solely by her dad. Now, Pam actually does play a pretty significant role in this case. So even though she's not a part of Courtney's childhood, she still pops up in this story. And this whole thing with Pam is just like, oh, God. And you'll understand why I'm like pulling this face. I'm just so disgusted with the Pam situation, but we'll get to that later on in the case. So Pam had seven children with five different fathers and Pam walked out on five of those children, leaving those five children to be raised by their dad. So the situation that happened with Courtney was not unique. However, the really strange thing about Pam is that even though she walked out on Courtney, she still kind of stayed in her life and it was just really really weird she would actually pretend to be a family friend and I just think that that is so weird so Courtney would bump into Pam around town and think that Pam was a family friend Pam would also go over to Courtney and Tim's house for dinner on certain occasions as a family friend. But Pam never wanted to be a mom to Courtney. She only ever went over to the house for dinner when she needed food, when she needed help, and Tim would always try and help her. And Courtney never knew that Pam was actually her biological mother, and neither one of her parents ever told her. And Courtney's dad, Tim, actually did seem to genuinely care about Courtney and always wanted the best for her and always tried his best, which will become apparent as well later on in the case. What we do know is at the age of 12, Courtney would actually discover 
that Pam was her biological mother. So at the age of 12, Courtney was rummaging through the family car looking for cigarettes, which why the hell is a 12 year old looking for cigarettes anyway? But that is beside the point. So she's rummaging through this car looking for cigarettes when she comes across a hospital bracelet. That is her hospital bracelet from when she was born. And on that hospital bracelet, it said that Pamela Hamby was her biological mother. And that is how Courtney found out that Pam, this family friend, was actually her mom. Which can you even imagine finding out that way that this family friend that you have known of all your life is actually your biological mom? That must have been absolutely traumatic but not only that, as soon as Courtney found out that Pam was her mom, Courtney wanted a relationship with Pam. She wanted to forge that mother-daughter relationship, but Pam wasn't interested. She was just like, eh, no, don't want to know. So that was Courtney's childhood. So now we get to 2013. Courtney is currently 20 years old and Chris is currently 23. So even though Pam had said to Courtney that she wasn't interested in a mother-daughter relationship, she had kind of stuck around almost as that family family friend and Pam was actually the one that introduced Courtney and Chris to each other. And from that very first meeting, Chris has said that he knew that he loved Courtney, that he just had that instant love at first sight, that he had never felt that way about anyone else before. And Courtney felt the same. But there was one problem. They were cousins first cousins. So Chris was actually Pam's nephew. Chris was the son of Pam's brother. So because Pam hadn't really played any kind of part in Courtney's life, Chris and Courtney didn't know that they were cousins. And when Pam introduced Courtney and Chris to one another, she failed to say, oh, this is your cousin, Chris, or this is your cousin, Courtney, your cousins. She failed to mention that what the hell? What the hell? If you are introducing two people to each other and they are related and they don't know, surely you should say, oh, by the way, you're related. But the thing with Pam is, this is a little spoiler, it doesn't seem to matter to Pam if you are blood related if you know what I mean. So maybe that is why she didn't introduce them to each other as cousins, because in Pam's eyes, it doesn't matter. Keep it in the family. So Chris and Courtney start dating. And when they first started dating, they didn't know they were cousins. And then at some point, I don't really know, the timeline is a bit iffy, but at some point, a family member said to them, um, do you guys know that you're cousins? Maybe this whole dating thing is not really what you want to do. And I don't know how Chris and Courtney reacted. I would love to know how they reacted because I feel like a normal response to that would be shock and horror. But I do know that it didn't seem to bother Chris or Courtney. It didn't seem to bother them that they were blood related, that they were first cousins, which I, I don't know how that doesn't bother them, but it didn't bother them. They just said, I can't help how my heart feels. In fact, Chris has actually said, quote, I can't help how my heart feels. I guess most people in the world will probably think it's sick, but at least we got the knowledge that we didn't know each other growing up. So yeah, it's odd, but I wouldn't take it back if I could. I wouldn't take it back if I could. Huh. So they are going full steam ahead with their relationship, even though they're cousins. I feel like I'm going to keep repeating that. And it is said that the family were embarrassed by the relationship, especially Chris's dad, Michael. He was absolutely horrified that his son was dating his niece. But again, it didn't matter. It didn't matter to Chris and Courtney what anyone thought. They were in love. And they soon started to proclaim to everyone that they were husband and wife. Now, they weren't actually husband and wife legally. They just started telling everyone that. And when I saw that, that they weren't actually married, they were just saying that they were, I initially thought, oh, it's because they're not legally allowed to get married because they're first cousins. So I did a little bit of digging and it's actually not illegal in Georgia to marry your first cousin. So it is legal to marry your first cousin in Georgia and Georgia is not the only state that allows it. Actually 19 states allow marriage between first cousins. It's like come on just find someone else. Find anyone else. So they could technically get married in the eyes of the law but they didn't. I, I don't really know why they didn't but they um, decided to take their relationship to the next level and that was have children together, which 
no, no, no. So a year after they met, Courtney fell pregnant with their first child. So it is now 2015. Chris is now 25 and Courtney is currently 22. And this is when she gives birth to their first child, a little girl that they named Clarissa. And Courtney at this point was hoping that the birth of their little girl would kind of make them a family, help things settle down because Chris is not exactly a family kind of person, is he? Courtney really wanted to be the mother to her daughter that her mother never was to her. But did that happen? Of course it didn't. First of all, Chris was very abusive to Courtney. I mean, we all know that he's very volatile. He is very aggressive. He would physically abuse her. And family members would quite often see Courtney covered in bruises. And then on top of that, Chris would also sleep with other women all the time. He would repeatedly cheat on Courtney, go behind her back. He was actually quite the master of having affairs. He would create many secret Facebook accounts to talk to other women. There was one woman called Danielle, which I find always really weird when I have to say my own name. So there was this one woman called Danielle who Chris was sleeping with in 2014 when Courtney was currently pregnant. And when Courtney found out about this, apparently Courtney and Danielle got into this huge, huge fight and then, I'm sorry, I'm gonna have to stop for a second because this is just disturbing. It's just, oh God. So Chris sets up these secret Facebook accounts to talk to other women. And there is evidence that he set up one of these secret Facebook accounts to talk to Pam. Yes, that is right, Pam, who is Courtney's biological mother, but also Pam is Chris's aunt and not an aunt by marriage or anything like that. She is a blood relative to Chris. And there is, I don't know if you wanna call it evidence. There is definitely things that suggest that Pam and Chris had a sexual relationship. It's like, oh my God, this is what I mean when I said Pam likes to keep it in the family. Now, when I was watching the trial for this case, Pam was on the stand to give evidence, obviously. And she was asked point blank if she had a sexual relationship with Chris and she did deny it. But the look on her face and just her body language, I feel like she's lying. Well, you're actually closer to Chris, aren't you? No. Didn't y'all have a secret Facebook account so that you could go behind my client's back? He had secret Facebook accounts from to keep from Courtney to talk to people, but, but it wasn't just me and him. But y'all got together on certain occasions and no. had little... Absolutely not. Y'all never had any... No. <laughs> I don't buy it. There was definitely something strange going on. Like, oh God. And there are a few photos of Pam and Chris together that definitely look questionable. So yeah, that is absolutely gross. It was also at this point that Chris started on his tattoo journey and he got the phrase face up or lace up tattooed on his face, which is apparently a reference to Machine Gun Kelly. I don't know if it is. As well as the word loyalty tattooed above his right eyebrow, which is really strange because I don't think he understands the definition of the word loyalty. It's just really strange that he had that word tattooed on him. And Chris, on top of being very abusive to Courtney, basically being a non-existent dad, sleeping with pretty much anyone that he could, he was still getting in trouble with the law. Things had not changed from when he was younger. And obviously he'd spent um, a pretty significant time in prison. He spent approximately four years in prison and you would think that that maybe would have taught him a lesson, but no. Because in 2015, and this was only a few months after his daughter was born, Chris had somehow managed to rack up five separate arrest warrants. And finally he was tracked down from police and he fled the scene. He ran away, which he likes to do. And in the process of running away, he actually hit one of the officers with a tree branch in the face, which caused a pretty serious gash on the officer's face. Thankfully, Chris was caught and arrested for all of his prior arrests.
arrest warrants and obviously he was also charged with the assault on the officer and he was sent to prison for 14 months. So now we skip forward to September 2016. This is when Chris finally gets out of prison. Now during his time in prison, Courtney was actually living with her dad, Tim, and he was really helping out raising baby Clarissa and just helping out financially where he could, like babysitting, like he was really helpful. And from what I can tell, like Courtney's dad is a pretty good guy. So now that Chris is out of prison, he wants to give this family life a go. And what does he want to do? He wants to have another child. Now, I don't really know why Chris decided, yeah, let's have another baby. I did see that because he was in prison for Clarissa's early life and he missed out on a lot of things he wanted to kind of do over, which you can't exactly do over, but I feel like that is why he wanted another child. So Courtney falls pregnant and it's around this time that they move into their first home together. This home was a trailer located at plot 31 at Eagle Point Mobile Home Park, which is in Covington, Georgia. And unfortunately this trailer would be the place where today's tragic events take place. So they're living this like family life now in their home. Chris gets a few odd jobs here and there to earn money. Courtney is a stay-at-home mom. She's obviously pregnant as well and everything should be great. You know, I just feel like, come on, wake up. They have everything. They have all the tools to actually have a really great life together. But is that the case? No. Now it's thought that both Chris and Courtney had a pretty serious meth addiction. Now I know that Chris was addicted to meth. He used to do meth all the time. He's actually said himself that he would do meth every single day. And why I say it's thought that they both had a meth addiction, it's because it's not really clear whether Courtney had a meth addiction. She definitely did do drugs and she did take meth from time to time, but I don't know if her addiction was as serious as Chris's. Courtney and Chris struggled to maintain the household and this trailer, their home, it was an absolute mess. It was filthy. It wasn't just messy, it was dirty. They had stuff everywhere. It was hard to even move around. And this trailer had two bedrooms, but the spare bedroom or what should have been Clarissa's bedroom was just full of junk. And the three of them, Chris, Courtney and Clarissa all slept in one room and Clarissa was on this little mattress that was sandwiched between Courtney and Chrissy's bed and the wall. So she didn't really have a proper bedroom or anything. And it's just like, come on, you have a spare bedroom right there. Clean it up for your daughter. But they weren't willing to clean up the trailer. They weren't willing to maybe get rid of some stuff, clean it up, make Clarissa a really nice bedroom. On top of all of this as well, Chris was still domestically abusive. Courtney would still be seen covered in bruises from time to time. And there were disputes all the time in their home. Neighbors would hear them like arguing like crazy. Police were called on a number of occasions and on one occasion Chris had smashed a window in the trailer from a fit of rage and this is just very reminiscent of his childhood. He has always been very very destructive. When he is angry he lashes out. I know it seems like I'm really going in on Chris which I am, don't get me wrong, but Courtney is not innocent either. Like she is no angel. She always seems to put herself and Chris before her children. She always puts drug taking in front of her children. Her children always just seem to be an afterthought to her. So this is definitely not a stable home, definitely not the ideal home to be raising children in. And it is this point in the story that little baby Kalia McNabb is born. And she entered into this very toxic, very volatile, world. And from the moment she was born, she was never thought about. She was never the priority of either one of her parents. She had an extremely short life. She was only on this planet for 15 days. And for every single one of those days, she was never a priority to her parents. Okay, so things from this moment on move pretty quickly. So Kalia McNabb was born on the 23rd of September 2017. She was born one month premature and she only weighed five pounds. She also had to be kept in hospital following her birth due to a high white blood cell count. But apart from that, everything was fine. She was actually a pretty healthy baby. They just wanted to keep her in to make sure like everything was okay. And then four days later on the 27th of September, Chris and Courtney were able to bring Kalia home. Now this is a pretty happy, a very emotional time in someone's life. Like they're bringing home their newborn baby. That newborn baby is your whole world. It is your priority, the first thing that you think about. But was that the case for Chris and Courtney? 
No. Because four days later, on the 1st of October, Courtney takes baby Kalia over to her cousin Megan's house. She stays to have a little chat with her cousin and then she disappears and leaves her newborn baby at her cousin's house. She also leaves her two-year-old daughter at her cousin's as well and then she just disappears for two days days. Now her cousin Megan already had four children of her own and now Courtney has just snuck out the house and left her two children at her cousin's house. This is what I mean. Courtney is not innocent in this situation. She has never prioritize her children. Now what she is doing in those two days, I assume Chris and Courtney have disappeared together. No one knows, but I feel like it's probably safe to assume they were doing drugs. And I just cannot get over the fact that Courtney and Chris have had their newborn baby, Kalia, for four days, and then they just abandon their newborn baby at someone's house. I cannot get over that. So Megan, understandably, she was struggling because like I said, she had four kids of her own. Now there are six children in this household. So Tim, Courtney's dad, finds out that his grandchildren have been dropped off at Megan's house and he is not happy. He was really hoping that Courtney was going to step up and be a good mom. So Tim goes over and collects the newborn baby, Kalia. He goes over to Courtney and Chris's trailer, obviously to see if they're there and their trailer is a mess. It's even worse than normal. So Tim leaves the trailer. He actually takes Courtney and Chris's car with him as punishment. And I just want to point out that Tim was the one that bought this car for Courtney to try and help her out. So he takes the car back as punishment and he takes baby Kalia home with him. All of a sudden, after two days, Courtney rocks up at her cousin Megan's house to collect her two children. Her two-year-old Clarissa is there collects her, and then she is furious that her dad has taken baby Kalia. And it's just like, Courtney, how can you be furious at your dad for looking after your daughter after you abandoned her? Courtney even dials 911 to report that her dad has kidnapped her baby. And they didn't give you a reason why? They said that they were taking my kids, that I had left them at my cousin's house for a whole day and a whole night, and I mean, I don't feel an issue with that. But this actually backfired on Courtney because not only did the police agree with Tim and say that Kalia should be with her granddad, that is a better home for her, but they also said that two-year-old Clarissa would also be better off living with her granddad until Chris and Courtney had gotten their act together. So this is what happened. Tim is now looking after both of his granddaughters and Chris was absolutely furious that his father-in-law had taken his two children, but Chris was more furious that his father-in-law had taken the car. Mm -hmm. You heard that right. Out of everything that is going on, Chris is the most upset about the car. In fact, at one point, Chris tried to bargain with his father-in-law and tries to say, oh, you can keep the kids as long as I get the car back. I'm sorry, what? You are trying to bargain to get a car back? in exchange for your children, really? And I think this is another example of how Tim is just trying to do the right thing by his grandchildren and his daughter. He's always just trying to do the right thing. But ultimately he did feel really guilty about taking the children off of Courtney. So in the end, he said to Courtney, look, if you get your place tidied up, if you get it clean, tidy, organized, I will drop the kids back. But you've got to get that trailer looking good and you've got to make it appropriate to be raising children in. And this is what happened. And three days later, on the 6th of October, 2017, the trailer was all tidy, cleaned up, everything, and Tim dropped his two grandchildren back at the trailer. But very sadly, this would actually be the last time that Tim would see his granddaughter, Kalia, alive. On the morning of the 7th of October, 2017, Courtney placed a 911 call. Neaton County 911, just the emergency. I just woke up, my dog woke me up on the couch. Um, I have a two-year-old and I have a two-week-old, and my my two-week-old is not in her sleeper. Her pack is on the floor. She's not in her sleeper. I She's not in her sleeper. She, she, she's not here. She stated that she woke up at around 10 a.m. and she went to check on her newborn baby daughter and discovered that she was missing. So on the call, you can hear that Courtney sounds pretty frantic. My, my, my two-year-old came to woke me up. That's how she's on the count. Hello! How old is she, ma'am? Two weeks old. 
She says that she last saw Kalia at approximately 5 a.m. and then she fell asleep on the sofa and Chris also fell asleep on the sofa and now it was 10 a.m. and baby Kalia has gone. She was saying that she has looked everywhere for her daughters. She has checked with friends and family and no one has her. No one has seen her. At one point on the call, you can actually hear Courtney calling out for Kalia. Kalia! Which is kind of strange, isn't it? Because Kalia is two weeks old. She is not going to respond to her name. She's not going to come walking into the room. She's not going to say, oh, hi, mom, I'm over here. It's just very strange, isn't it? And I did see that a lot of other people also find that strange. But I suppose in a genuine moment of stress, like you may call out your baby's name. Like you may, I don't know. So the police arrive and they're wearing body cams and you can actually see Courtney's like reaction. She also has a black eye that does look pretty recent, but obviously we know that Chris is very abusive. I mean, who, who would have possibly come and got her? No one. I called my grandparents, I called my dad, I called anybody that would have came and gotten her. So the police are asking, does Courtney have any idea of where Kalia could be? At one point, she even tries to blame Clarissa, who is the two-year-old. It's like, really, you're gonna try and blame your other daughter for this? The police also then start to ask, where's Chris? Like, where is he? Eventually they found Chris wandering around the woods because there's like a woodland area behind the trailer. They eventually find Chris wandering around in these woods. The police did find this suspicious because it's almost like Chris was trying to avoid the police. Now, Chris claims that he was in the woods trying to find baby Kalia, but the police did find this suspicious because they were just thinking, well, why are you searching the woods unless you know she's in there? So when the police find finally catch up to Chris and they ask him like do you know anything and immediately Chris is on the defensive. So they bring him in for questioning, they also bring Courtney in for questioning and the trailer is immediately turned into a crime scene and this is when the search for baby Kalia starts. So in Chris's interview again he is immediately on the defensive. He starts telling the police out of nowhere might I add that he had nothing to do with this and that it must be someone else. Else. He's already starting to build up that defense and that story. Chris literally starts pointing the finger at every single person he can think of. He even started rambling at one point that he'd gotten into this fight with this man called Matt Lester. And Chris was like, oh, it must be him. It must be that Matt Lester. I bet you it was him that stole Kalia. But the police were not buying this whatsoever because regardless of this Matt Lester, even if he wanted revenge on Chris, why the hell would he break into their home into their trailer. Remember that Chris is sleeping on the sofa. So why would this Matt Lester break into the trailer, see that Chris was sleeping on the sofa, walk past him to then steal a two week old baby. So the police were really suspicious of Chris at this point because he literally was trying to blame everybody else for his daughter going missing. But they let him go because right now they don't have any evidence that anything has happened to even tie him to anything. They obviously haven't even found baby Kalia at this point. They also interview Courtney and again, they let her go because there's no reason to hold them. So following the interviews, Chris and Courtney rejoin the search for their their daughter. Now at this point pretty much everyone in the community knows what has happened. There is even a news crew at one point reporting on what has happened and Chris makes a very uh, dramatic appearance. But I want my kid back, man. That's my child, man. I want my kid, man. People have speculated that it was a little bit too frantic, too dramatic. So the search continues and on the evening of the 7th of October, obviously Kalia was reported missing on the morning of the 7th of October. Chris and Courtney seemed tired. So they decided to go back to their cousin's house to rest. Now there is nothing wrong with getting tired, wanting to rest, wanting a break from everything. But the thing is when Chris and Courtney were at their cousin's house, they didn't really seem that bothered about what was going on. It's like their daughter is missing. You know, I just, I don't know. I just feel like you wouldn't go to bed. You wouldn't go to sleep. You would be searching. So Chris and Courtney 
go to sleep. And then the next morning, the cousin whose house they're staying at wakes up early to rejoin the search for Kalia. But when he gets up, Chris and Courtney are still just asleep on the sofa. And he's like, um, are you going to get up? Are you going to go out and search for your daughter? But they decided to stay sleeping on the couch. They seem really concerned, don't they? And then who shows up? Pam. <laughs> Good old Pam. Good old keep it in the family Pam. So currently Pam was not in Courtney's life because she did kind of come in and out. But all of a sudden Pam shows up. She would heard about what had happened and she wanted to help. She was all too eager to help Chris and Courtney prepare for their TV interview. So Chris, Courtney, Pam and another friend, Lauren, make their way to the trailer, which is where the TV interview is going to take place. On the way to the trailer, they get some devastating news. Courtney receives a call to say that Kalia has been found. Now in this car, all hell breaks loose. First of all, no one actually knew if Kalia was found found dead or alive. They just knew that Kalia had been found. Courtney and Lauren took this news as Kalia is alive. She's been found alive. But Chris took this news the complete opposite. Instead, Chris starts shouting, they're going to put this on me. They're going to blame this on me. And then Pam, good old Pam, turns to Chris and says, run. You got to remember that Kalia is Pam's granddaughter. I know that she's not in their lives, but she is biologically Kalia's grandmother. But her first thought is not about her granddaughter, not even about her daughter, but about protecting Chris. So Chris opens the door and dives out of a moving car and runs in the opposite direction. Chris is now on the run, which is very common for him to run away. He has done this many times, if you think back to his criminal record at the beginning of the video. But Lauren continues driving to the trailer, they need to get to Kalia. And when they get to the trailer, this is when the news was broken to them that Kalia was not found alive. Earlier that day in the woods, by the trailer, a member of the search party looking for Kalia noticed that there was a log in the woods and this log was sitting over a hole in the ground. And once the log was moved, a blue Nike drawstring bag was found. And very sadly, Kalia's body was inside that bag. Also in the bag were several items of men's clothing. And the fact that she was just wrapped in the men's clothing and there was also a blanket and the fact that she was just put in a bag and discarded in the woods as if she is a piece of rubbish, it's just absolutely sickening. So after Kalia's body was discovered, Chris was nowhere to be found and the police were looking around and they said to Courtney, where's Chris? Where is he? And when Courtney said that she had no idea where he was, Chris immediately became prime suspect number one and a huge manhunt went underway to find him. But it didn't actually take them that long to find Chris because after a few hours on the run, Chris decides to walk into a local gas station and cause an absolute scene. He was soaking wet. He was covered in mud and leaves like he'd been running through woods, which I think he was. He was acting very frantic, very jittery, almost like he had been taking meth recently. And he just goes off on one at the cashier at the gas station. He starts shouting at the cashier, I didn't do it. I didn't do it. It wasn't me. But the cashier calls 911. Actually, a few people call 911 and say that the man you're looking for is here in the gas station. And Chris is finally arrested. Chris was taken down to the station. And given the fact that Kalia was found in his Nike bag that Courtney has reported went everywhere with Chris, Kalia was also found with the clothes that Chris was wearing on the night of the murder. The detectives thought that this was enough to actually charge Chris with malice murder, felony murder, aggravated battery, and concealing the death of a baby. As the investigation continued, the detectives also realized that Courtney may be involved as well. They decided that through neglect, Courtney was also responsible for the murder of Kalia. So three months after they initially arrested Chris, Courtney was also arrested and charged with second degree murder 
child cruelty and deprivation of a minor. And in May of 2019, which is not that long ago, the trial finally took place. Courtney and Chris were tried together and it was a five day trial. And actually all of the trial footage is available on YouTube. So after this video, if you wanted to go and watch the trial, you can. Many witnesses were called during the trial. There were different friends, there were different cousins, there were aunts, Courtney's dad, Tim also gave evidence. There was also one woman that Chris was apparently having a secret affair with and Courtney's mom, Pam, gave evidence. I've just got to say, she's probably not the most reliable witness. Y'all never had any? No. <laughs> And let me tell you, it was a mess. It was a mess, a whole mess, that trial. Half the time, I didn't have a clue what was going on. Everyone had their own version of events that were just all slightly different. And it was a lot of, he said this, she said that, blah, blah, blah. And it was really difficult to actually figure out who was reliable. Out of all of these witnesses, who the hell is reliable? But what was clear is that this relationship between Chris and Courtney was very toxic. Chris is not the best person. And it was definitely plausible that they were both responsible. And then on top of the witness evidence, there was another thing that has stayed with me and it is the autopsy results. And I've got to warn you, this is not going to be easy to hear. I am going to go into detail on the autopsy results on what was found, Kalia's injuries, her cause of death. So if you don't want to hear this, and I already feel like I'm getting emotional, wow. If you don't want to hear this, just skip forward. So first of all, the autopsy revealed that Kalia had suffered multiple injuries to the head, which included bruises, multiple fractured bones, and a large cut below one of her eyes, which is thought to have been caused by a sharp object. Kalia also had significant blunt force trauma to the mouth, which caused her baby teeth, which obviously she's only 15 days old. She doesn't have baby teeth, but obviously everyone is born with baby teeth. They're just really far down in the gums. But the blunt force trauma was so severe to her mouth and to her gums, but it actually caused her baby teeth to penetrate back into the gums like they came out but some of her baby teeth had fallen out altogether. And finally, as part of the autopsy, Kalia's brain needed to be examined. So the examiner made an incision from the ear all the way around the back of the head to the other ear and then peeled the scalp back to reveal the skull. But when she did that, when she peeled the scalp back, what should have been skull there in front of her was a big gaping hole. Whole. Now, obviously a baby's skull is a lot softer than an adult's, but it should still be there. It should still be a formed skull, but it was just a hole. And then inside the brain was actually not recognizable as a brain. The brain had actually completely liquefied because there was so much blood on the brain, which is just like, what the hell? What the hell happened to that poor baby? to cause such trauma to the brain, for it to bleed so much, for it to turn into liquid. And the examiner had to actually scoop out the brain and place it in a tub so she could look at it because it was just liquid. It was determined that these injuries could have only been sustained from repeated blows to the head. Kalia's cause of death was actually blunt force trauma and it was determined that she was murdered. There is no way that those injuries could have been accidental in any way. The jury were also also presented with even more damning evidence. Chris was the last person to see Kalia alive. Chris was actually awake between the hours of 5 a.m. and 10 a.m., which is the hours that Kalia was murdered and then went missing. And the prosecution were able to determine this because of Facebook messages that Chris was sending between those hours. He was actually messaging other women on Facebook, and it's just absolutely sick. On top of all of that, Kalia was found in Chris's bag and also she was wrapped in his clothes that he was wearing the night before the murder. Chris also displayed some pretty bizarre behavior after they found Kalia's body. I mean, he went on the run. Why would he go on the run if he didn't know what happened? And after all of that evidence, the jury found Christopher McNabb guilty on all charges. And he was sentenced to life in prison and Courtney was also found guilty on her charge 
charges and she was sentenced to 30 years in prison. Following the sentencing, Chris was actually given an opportunity to speak to the courtroom and this is what he said. I'm innocent, I didn't do it. Okay. I've, I've maintained that the whole time. Just because somebody has domestic abuse issues with their spouse doesn't mean that they would put their hands on their kids. I just don't understand how you find somebody guilty of doing something to a 15 day old baby. And I would never do it. I would never do this. That's all I gotta say, I would never do it, I'm innocent. And one final very shocking thing about Chris, not even about this case, but about Chris. So apparently a week after Kalia's death, when Chris was in prison, a psychologist went to visit him. So during this interview, Chris was behind a piece of glass. He was wearing a turtle suit, which is very common when a prisoner is on suicide watch. Chris was not wearing any clothing under his turtle suit. And then at some point in the interview, Chris stood up. He exposed his penis to the psychologist and started to masturbate to completion in front of her. Pulled up the turtle suit and taken out his penis and was masturbating. And did he masturbate um, to completion in your presence? He did. Which is absolutely disgusting. That just tells you the kind of person that he is. He did try and make an excuse for this. He did try and say, oh, my turtle suit got stuck and my penis just accidentally came out. I just like, I just like uh, the court to know that I did have on a, a turtle suit and it Velcros and it wasn't on properly and it didn't fit properly and the Velcros were not on good because they don't stick because they they've been used for so many years by so many different people and I was not masturbating at all in front of her, period. He started ranting and raving that it wasn't true. And it's just like, why would she lie? She is a professional. And then following this sentencing hearing, Chris was taken away to prison and he is still there and he is going to be there for the rest of his life. But now we need to talk about Courtney because obviously she was found guilty on all of her charges and sentenced to 30 years. Now there was a lot of evidence presented against Courtney during the trial, but it's kind of hard to actually figure out what her involvement was. I mean, when I was watching the trial, I could not figure out who had done what. Like I couldn't figure out, I couldn't figure out if Chris had done this on his own, if Courtney had done it on her own, had they done it together, I honestly couldn't figure it out. But then my mind was kind of made up because during the trial, recordings of the phone conversations between Chris and Courtney were played out. Now, these conversations were when Chris was in jail awaiting trial. And this was obviously before Courtney was arrested for her involvement. And to be honest, it's kind of hard to understand what either of them are saying, especially Courtney. But in the calls, Courtney is definitely trying to plead her innocence. She's definitely trying to come across as an emotional, distraught mother. And it definitely seems a bit forced. It kind of seems like maybe she's putting on a performance. But anyway, I was listening to these calls during the trial and then the calls ended and the camera was on Courtney's face. And her facial expression after these phone calls told me everything. She literally had guilty written all over her face. She looked so smug. I could not believe it. My jaw literally hit the ground when I saw Courtney's face. The smirk that she had on her face, it was almost like she was thinking, yeah, I'm really proud of that performance on that phone call. They're never going to think I'm guilty because I will play her facial expression because you have to see it. I'm going to that I'm Friday. I You're right. Take them back up. It's like, who the hell pulls that facial expression? You are currently sat in a courtroom. You are on trial for the murder of your daughter. And up until that point, I actually didn't know what Courtney's involvement was. I just wasn't sure. But after that phone call, after her reaction to that phone call, I feel like Courtney is involved somehow. And of course, she was found guilty and sentenced to 30 years. However, in February of 2022, mm -hmm, so February this year, after approximately three years after the trial, Courtney's conviction was overturned. 
In the end, it was determined that the evidence against her was insufficient and Courtney was released to get on with her life. Now, Chris himself has also made numerous appeals. They have all been denied and he still remains in prison to this day. And I just feel like this is probably going to be one of those cases where we're never actually going to know what happened. But regardless, I want to end this video remembering Kalia. Kalia McNabb entered the world on the 23rd of September, 2008. And 17. She had dark blue eyes, dark brown hair, and a small mole on the left side of her hairline. She was described as a little miracle by her grandfather, Tim Bell, who loved her dearly and would have done anything to help raise her. She was taken from this world far too soon, and unbelievably, she was only 15 days old. It's hard to even wrap your head around somebody doing those things, those awful things to a newborn baby. I just don't know how anyone can be that evil. So that is the end of this video. Um, I don't really know what to say. Let me know what your thoughts, theories and opinions are on this case. Also, don't forget to let me know your case suggestions because I always want to know what you want to hear next. Thank you again to ExpressVPN for sponsoring today's video. Don't forget you can get three months of ExpressVPN for free by going to the link in my description box and I'll see you all in my my next video. Bye.